April has been very sketchy for me. I've been in and out, in and out all the time. And it feels kind of strange. Every time I haven't been here for a little while, I feel nervous when I come back. Um, but um, the passage that Donna read so beautifully today is such a special passage to me personally. It speaks of restoration. It speaks of, 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 of taking something that is, is kind of been um, destroyed and, and rebuilding it, making it new again. And, 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 and I look at my own life and I think, wow, God, you, you've done that for me. You've, you've taken a life that has been so destroyed by sin, so destroyed by humanity, so destroyed by my own carnal flesh, that sometimes it's barely recognizable. And you, you can take it and you can make it into something so beautiful that, that, that just not only touches my heart, but touches everybody's hearts around me. And that is so special to me. I don't know about you, but there's, there's a few programs on TV that I love to watch. And one of them is where they will take a car and this thing has been eaten by rust, and it looks like an absolute piece of junk. And they, they see something beautiful. They see this car, and they, they, they know what to do instinctively, especially this one guy. He does everything himself, from disassembling to taking out the rust to painting to doing everything. And then you see the finished product, and it just looks nothing like the product that he had before. And to watch them painstakingly take this vehicle, whether it be a motorbike or a car, and then restore it. And, 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 and you see at the end, you see the whole process, and you're kind of like, yeah, I can see where you're going. But then when it's done, you're like, wow, he had that in his mind all along, and yet I only can see the wreck and then the, the finished product. So those are the only two things that, that, that I can see, but, but this man who's restoring it sees much more. He's able to, 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 to look at it and see the new parts laid in, to see the rust being removed, to see just everything restored to its, 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 its former glory or even better. And that's kind of where we are right now in this passage. This passage is a passage of hope, of incredible hope for, for both yourself and for myself. As we, as we look at Scripture and, and we open it up and we read these words, it's just five verses, but so much is packed into those five verses and so many of those, those, those verses and those words apply to us today as we look at our lives. As every day we take the step Closer, hopefully closer and closer to Christ and what he's doing in our lives. We see this restoration in various places in Scripture. We see it in, in, in the lady caught in adultery. She, she's caught in the act of adultery, so this lady must probably had very little on. How embarrassing to, to yank a girl out of bed when she's been with a bloke and, and, and parade her amongst all the, And then she knows that she's going to die. The law of Moses says she's got to be stoned to death. That, that, that she's got to be done away with. And then Jesus lovingly says to her, looks into her face, says, daughter, your sins are forgiven. Go and sin no more. And, and, and this love that's in her heart is just, is just palpable. It's, just, it's, it's exploding out of every pore of her body. And she sees her old life is now gone, and the newness of life has been, has been transported back into her life through the words of Jesus Christ. Jesus looks at her in love, absolute love. Think of blind Bartimaeus. Son of Timaeus. We don't even know his name. How he cries out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And everybody else is trying to shut him down. But he knows that there's restoration, there's hope in the name of Jesus. And Jesus can take a person who's been blind from birth and can restore sight but then there's a greater sight. There's a sight of a heart looking out, knowing that sins have been forgiven. And that a heart is open to receive the Son of God. But none is more confronting than that restoration of Peter. 
We've just come through Easter and we've seen the ravages of the cross. We've seen Jesus hanging on the cross. We've seen him being tortured. We've seen him being mocked, being scorned, dead, buried, resurrected. And there's joy on that Sunday. But somehow the disciples kind of know that he's been resurrected to life, but, but it doesn't really dawn on them. It's not deep down in their hearts. They haven't come to that realization that the Savior lives and everything is going to change. Nothing is going to be the same again. Somehow that doesn't kind of get in. And, and for Peter, maybe, maybe it's because of what he did to Jesus. We all recall that, that he's there just outside, peering into the courtyard where Jesus is having his trials. And he's warming himself by the fire because it's cold. And then one by one, people say to him, I think you were with, the, with, with this Jesus of... No, I don't know him. You, I'm sure you... No, no, no. And then he starts bringing curses down on himself. I swear to you that I do not know this man and the rooster crows. And the guilt sets in. Can you imagine Peter's heart? Bold Peter, cut your ear off the, 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 the servant Peter. Peter who will say anything at any time. Brash Peter is now destroyed Peter. He's now Peter that, 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 that is almost a shell of a man of what he used to be. So here we have Peter broken. He knows the Savior is alive. He's seen him with his own eyes. They all have. This will be the third encounter that the disciples will have with Jesus. So the disciples do what they know. What do they do? They go fishing. When you're tired, do you go fishing? <laughs> I know a lot of people are like, I'm sick of life. I just want to go fishing. It's a great thing to do. But this is their life. This is what they do. This is everything of their poor. Now that the Savior is now resurrected and we're just going to go fishing. We need a bit of headspace. Let's just go and... And they battled the whole night. And they fished and fished and fished and caught nothing. Absolutely nothing. And Jesus greets them and says to them, cast your net on the other side of the boat. Really? <laughs> We've been, you know, the fish, they're all around the boat. Why on the other side of the boat? Why didn't he say, well, row out a bit further and then cast your net? No, cast your net. On the other side, and they catch huge amounts of fish. And, and Peter knows exactly who it is. He knows that it's Jesus that has just commanded them. So brash Peter takes out his outer garment, puts them on, and then jumps into the water. And he's on his way to see Jesus. He doesn't care about anybody else. Fishing, who cares about fishing? We've got fish. I'm going to go straight to Jesus. But there's a, there's a, there's a kind of a an emptiness inside of Peter. He knows that Jesus um, uh, is alive and, and there's a newness of, 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 of life in Jesus. And he knows that, that he can have that newness of life within himself. But there's still an apprehensiveness within Peter. He has Jesus on the beach and he's got a charcoal fire. And Peter brings some of the fish over and they put it on and there's some bread um, by the way, Sharon made some bread last night and set it for 7 o'clock this morning to be finished, and man, did we get into it. I don't, don't think there's anything left. So you can imagine some beautiful fish that's just been cooking, some lovely bread, and yet the disciples sit around the fire and Jesus is there. What a scene. What a lovely scene. You've got the, 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 the scene in the background, and you've got the disciples with their Savior sitting there. The smell of the ocean just beautiful. Verse 14 says, this was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. So they know that he's around and they know that he can appear and disappear any time. Jesus then speaks to Peter. And I think he's been dreading this. <laughs> do, do you know when you've been with a person and you've done something wrong and you're just waiting for them to bring it up <laughs> and you're kind of like, there's that intrepidation that you're just, you're just waiting, 
when are they going? And, and, and you kind of on urge, you know, just bring it up so we can get over and done with. I met with a, with a friend of mine about two weeks back, and um, I had a bit of animosity in my heart towards this guy. And he's a great guy, young, young guy. And he just loves the Lord. This guy just absolutely loves the Lord. And, and I actually phoned him up and I said, look, I need to meet with you. We need to talk. And so we met, had coffee, and I just said to him straight away, I said, brother, I need to ask you for your forgiveness. He said, what for? I said, I've had this attitude in my heart towards you, and, 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 and it's not right. And, and this is the reason, but it's not really, the, not really a good reason. I need your forgiveness. So I needed to get that out of the way so our relationship could carry on in the right vein. That we can have a closer, closer relationship than ever before. And that's exactly, he forgave me and and we had a closer relationship. We've got a closer relationship. And I think that's what Peter is thinking now. When is Jesus going to bring this up? We've just had breakfast. Is it coming? Then Jesus speaks to Peter. Notice the words that he uses. There's three very, very important words that he uses. The first one is agape. It's, used the, it's love. But it's not the earthly love that we know that we give each other Yeah, This is a, a pure, divine, heavenly love that comes from the Father, from the Father's heart, that sent Jesus down to earth. That's the agape love that Jesus is talking about. Then the second one is phileo, which is a brotherly love. You know Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. Um, That's the I like you love. I'm fond of you love. Then thirdly, there's another word called lupeo, which means deep, sorrowful, uh, almost sorry that you've done something. Not because you've been caught, but because God has convicted you of something within your heart. And that has changed you to want to repent, to want to come clean. And so, yeah, in this text, we don't really get it when we read it in English, but when you go into the Greek and you have a look at the Greek, it, it stands out like a sore thumb. It is massive. So, yeah, Jesus speaks to Peter for the first time. He says, Peter, do you love me? Agape, a pure sacrificial love. More than these disciples. That, that's a question that, that goes to the very heart of who Peter is. Do you love me, Peter? Are you willing to sacrifice yourself for me, Peter? But Peter answers, yes, Lord. You know that I phileo love you. You know that I'm fond of you. You know, you know that I like you, Jesus. You know that I, I like you like a good friend, Jesus. Can you see the the bar? How high the agape love is is above the phileo love? How, how, How massive the difference is there? When Jesus says, look what I did on the cross. That's agape love. And Peter, you fond of me? Second time. Jesus says to Peter, Peter, do you love me? That's at verse 16. Do you love me sacrificially? Will you lay down your life for me, Peter? As you walk the roads, will you give everything in your heart towards me? Will you forsake absolutely everything that you know, everything that you are, for the sake of the cross, for the sake of nailing yourself to a cross? Do you love me like that, Peter? Do you love me with a a love that is not of this world? Peter gives the same answer. Yes, Lord, you know that I love you like a friend or a brother. Can you imagine Jesus? How he must have felt inside of him. He has a man who he's poured his life into for three years, and he doesn't get it. Jesus, I'm fond of you. Once again, not the answer that Jesus was looking for. Then verse 17, he asks Peter a third time. But this time it is different. This time he says, Peter, do you phileo love me? Are you fond of me, Peter? Do you like me, Peter? The bar is now dropped by Jesus. 
And Peter, all of a sudden, he's cut to the heart. He's saying, Jesus, you, you, you're saying you're going to love me with this pure love. Pure. Now, all of a sudden, you love me as a brother? It really, really hurts. But you see, why it hurts too is because this really mirrors the denial of Jesus by Peter. And he knows that, that Jesus wants to pour his love and his, and, and his everything into Peter. And Peter recognizes that. Peter knows that Christ's love is pure, self-sacrificial, holy from above. So self-sacrificing that he gave his life for those chosen by God. Peter knows, that, the, knows this and it hurts him even more. But you see, this is not the only portion of restoration. There are three other challenges that, that Jesus gives to Peter. Because Peter's going to be this rock, this incredible rock that the church is going to be built with. In verse 15, he says, feed my lambs. In verse 16, he says, tend my lambs. In verse 17, he says, feed my sheep. This is a challenge, a command that Jesus gives to Peter. He looks at him straight in the eye. Can you imagine the disciples around? I'm staying out of this. <laughs> I don't want anything to do with this. Jesus and Peter are in something, yeah, and man, it looks serious. But can you imagine the, the intense um, uh, heart of the disciples listening in? to this intense love of Jesus as he speaks to his beloved Peter. He's saying to Peter, Peter, you are the pivotal part of God's plan for his church. You have an enormous role to play in the leading of the disciples and the leading of the church. Feed my lambs. Peter, who do they belong to? Do they belong to you? No, they belong to me. I died for them. I sacrificed my life for them. My life is for the forgiveness of their sins. Now you take these lambs, these beautiful little lambs who are going to be ravaged by wolves and you feed them. Nurture them, Peter. Give them spiritual milk to drink. Take them and, and, and take them in your hands and, and love them. Defend them with your life. Feed them, Peter. This is my command to you. Then Jesus says, tend my sheep. Peter, don't just nurture, but then tend, as if they, tend them if, as if they are your own. Peter, they are your responsibility. Look after them. Then thirdly, Jesus says, Peter, feed my sheep. Look after them, guide them, be an example to them, be obedient to me so that they might, might know what to do. Peter, you must be a shepherd that I want you to be. No longer self-seeking. It's not just about you, Peter. It's about me and what I've done for you. It's no longer a fondness of phileo love, but an agape love that is self-sacrificing. One that puts, puts jealousy to one side, puts envy to one side. That's not just looking for our own cause, but for the causes of others. It's no longer about you, Peter. It's about me, Jesus says. The restoration of Peter is almost complete. Can you imagine Peter just sitting there and then understanding, wow, this enormous sacrifice that Jesus gave on the cross and then rising from the dead changes the whole game. Everything that we have and are as believers has been changed by those actions. Jesus then in verse 18 tells Peter what is in his future. How many times have you heard Christians say to other, uh, other people who want to become believers, you know what, if you, if you become a believer, it's, you're going to have a happy life, it's going to be all sailing, sweet sailing, you're going to have a car, and you're going to have a family, and you're going to have, it's all these ble prosperity, prosperity. Jesus is saying to Peter, Peter, you know what, when you were young, you could go where you wanted, but a time's going to come when you are old, when somebody, when you stretch out your arms, somebody's going to grab you and dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. In that way, you were saying, Peter, one day people are going to take hold of you and you're going to give your life for my sake. But it's going to be to God's glory. It's not going to be for anything else, Peter. Understand that there's a cost 
to being a disciple of Jesus Christ. Peter now knows that if he follows Jesus, he will be led to his death. But it will be for God's glory. You can even hear the question, Peter, do you love me this much? Do you love me with that agape love where you're going to sacrifice yourself for the case of Christ? Do you love me enough to die for me? Will you give your life for others? But especially, will you give your life for the name and for the sake of Christ? What a question. What would you do? If Jesus sat with you there and he looked at you and he restored you, but then he said, you know what? You're going to die for me. People are going to come and they're going to arrest you. And you're going to have a mock trial and they're going to beat you. They're going to defame you. Your wonderful reputation that you build over many years is going to mean nothing. You're going to be an outcast in your society. Your family won't even want you. Jesus, just let you know that you will die a terrible death. Will you be obedient? Think a bit about your own heart. Will you be obedient? Will you say, yes, Lord, I will follow you, and then turn back later? Or will you say, Lord, what else have I got? I've got nothing else. Everything in this world is going to disappear. It'll be gone, but only you remain Jesus. Nothing and no one else counts. This world will disappear. You are eternal. You are immortal. Jesus is saying to Peter, Peter, follow me as I follow my father. Peter, sacrifice yourself for the sake of Christ. Peter, die for me. So here's the big question. What does this mean for both you and me today? What does it mean? We read a passage like this and we think, yeah, Peter's in the hot seat. I don't want to be in the hot seat. You are. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you are in the hot seat. As Jesus looked at Peter's heart and knew Peter's heart, he's looking at our hearts right now. And he sees right through absolutely all the rubbish we can put up. It means that even though we may have failed Jesus miserably, it's not too late. Look at your life. Think of it as if it's something on the screen. Yes, you failed Jesus, but what are you going to do about it? Are you going to stay wallowing in the mud and the muck? Or are you going to get up and say, Jesus, I don't care how many times I fall, I am going to get up because you call me. We may have failed God in the past, but if we are cut to the heart for our own sin, we have true sorrow, that lupeo sorrow in our hearts. 2 Corinthians 7.10 is such an important verse. Listen to this. It is beautiful. For godly grief produces a a repentance that leads to salvation without regret. If you come to Jesus and you repent of your sin, truly repent, not because you've been caught out, but because you want forgiveness of sin, there will not be regrets. You will never have regrets again. God wants you to place your life, your everything on the altar for him. All regrets will be done away with. But then there's a last little bit of that verse. It says, whereas worldly grief produces death. I'm sorry that I got caught out. I stole this. I'm sorry. What are you sorry for that I was caught? If I wasn't caught, I wouldn't be sorry. Brothers and sisters, God longs to restore us to a right relationship with himself. That's the cause of Christ, to come and to, and to knock at the door of your house and to say, let me in, let me sup with you, let me eat with you, let me live with you, let me sweep out all the old garbage that you've got in your life. Live for me. 
God wants to take your broken life and restore it. Even though we have denied Jesus, even though we have neglected Jesus, neglected his word, neglected his spirit, pushed it to one side, he still wants to have a relationship with you. Don't deny him. He is serious about this. And he's looking at your heart and he wants you. He so wants you. He loves you. He still wants to restore you to a right relationship. What is your response? What are you going to say? We can say things with our words, but our hearts can say something different. Only you can draw near to him. I can't do it for you. I can be up here and I can rant and rave and go crazy. But at the end of the day, it's you and your heart before Jesus. Only he can look into your heart. Do you love me? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, show us your pure love from the heart of the Father. Give us godly sorrow that leads to repentance, not just worldly sorrow. Forgive us of our sin. To restore us to a back, uh, back to a relationship with you. How oh, long, Lord, we long for that. In your mighty name we pray. Amen.